any of you who would be foolish enough to even think about leaving early today, <laughs> think twice. Um, this is, we're going to start off the afternoon with a bang, and we're going to keep going. And the last two speakers would be the, you know, I'm, I'm, I have absolutely no shame as a moderator, and I put two of the biggest surprises at the very end of the day. And um, I'm even tempted to say that we won't put that on tape, so if you, like, miss it, you missed it. Um, I don't know. I'll decide that later, depending on uh, if I see people slipping away. But just to let you know um, that the end of the day is going to also finish with the same bang. It will start right after lunch. So with that, you guys are seated. Let's take down the lights. Let's run a clip. Well, Jeff, can you, how about going back to that place in the control meta language where you start down the dialogue protocol a person would use? Okay. Uh, right over here in main control. Yeah. And off to another file where we're looking at real code now. <clears throat> and there's a branch of it down there. Yeah. These uh, top branches are all subroutines that are pretty meaningless. And it's WC means what case, and it's what... What's right. the person going to ask for? So open that one level down now. Right. Now, all those things in parentheses that in NLS are the names of those statements are actually in the programming language that works here. The way it's identified, that's the character a user hits. If he hits a D, for instance. A D here for delete? Right there. All right. If he hits a D, that line tells you what the response is supposed to be. The, the computer is supposed to display certain material on top of the screen. And then it's supposed to wait until the user does the next thing. Ah. Why don't you trim it to one line? So, Bill, will you come in through this intercom? Hello, Doug. Hi. I, I need to know what terminal you're on, Bill. 13. OK. I'd like to have him see my text. And so this special thing, if I label 13, will switch, switch over. So on his display, he sees my text. So I'll execute it. And sure enough, it does. But what's that? running around. Well, if he's looking at my text, he'd like to have something to say about it. So we put on a marker, a tracking spot that he controls. So he's sitting there in Menlo Park looking at this text, and he can point to it. But we've carefully reserved for me the right to control and operate on this, so my bug is more powerful than yours. <laughs> but we can have an argument. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they call a bug fight. So, all right. So uh, in case you haven't been listening, Bill, <laughs> we've been going through lots of examples and setting up in collaboration here so that we can go on into information retrieval. And we've set up now audio coupling, and we're both looking at the same display. And that'd be very handy to work. We can talk to each other and point. And maybe later I could hand you the chalk on this blackboard, like saying, here, you control it. But let's stay this mode now and add another feature that hardware-wise is available to the kind of display we have. I'd like to see you while I'm working on it. So before I can do that, I have to set up my display in a certain way. Set it up so it, I see it over like that, that leaves a corner up there. And I say, now, computer, do the automatic switching that'll bring in a camera picture from the camera mounted on his console, such as the camera mounted on mine is. Hi, Bill. That's great. Now we're connected audio, you can see my work, you can point at it, and I can see your face, and we can talk. So let's do some collaborating. You're silent. <laughs> oh. What do you want me to say? Yeah. There's nobody here but a large audience, Bill. All right. Doug and Bill have come back, and what we're going to do, they're going to have, they actually, they've been there for 30 years, um, a conversation about the current work of, the, of Doug and the Bootstrap Alliance. It's really important, as you cannot emphasize it enough, this is not just a project where there are ideas from 30 years ago that the industry still hasn't figured out how to use. That is the case. Meanwhile, Doug has 30 more years of ideas. This is a guy who works 12 hours a day on refining and perfecting this vision. And so while we're trying to catch up with a couple of decades ago, he's still racing off 
a couple of decades ahead. And he and, and Jeff are going to have a conversation about that. Gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, first I should point out the role Jeff has played in the past and in the present, that he was a key figure in the late 60s in getting our systems together in the software orientation and in helping make this presentation that you've been watching work from the software point of view, et cetera. So then he went off on his own trajectory for years. And uh, two years ago, uh, he started helping us trying to get our bootstrapping ideas in launch. So he's been a very strong supporter in there. And uh, uh, so the, the way this has taken shape is nine years ago, Christina, one of my daughters and I, set up this bootstrap institute and saying, look, if the way in which organizations are going to have to go to do this is complicated, et cetera, there needs to be a, a strategic approach. So let's set up this institute and raise the flag and say, hey, organizations, there really is a way to go to get some much more effective value out of all this revolution. And uh, so we plowed away for some years and, and got some, a lot of concepts. We can show you a few of them now because it's not very much time, but we show you a few of the concepts to give you a framework for that. And then two years ago, plus uh, Jeff and Martin Haberly sort of said, well, let's just get going. So we started doing a lot more planning with people. And a year and a half ago, set up something that's called the Bootstrap Alliance, which is a not-for-profit structure that can start taking contributions and donations and participation. Participation. <laughs> I, I just have to tell you that this day is almost undoing me. It's, uh, <laughs> so if I can be coherent for another 15 minutes, we'll be in good shape. Um, so anyway, so Jeff has had a lot of experience in corporate structures and in moving things and organizing things and et cetera. And what we found out, you know, 25, 30 years ago was uh, Doug, yeah, he, gets, he can point to something like that, but he's almost helpless in a lot of practical ways. So if there are not people around that can really do things, it never gets off the ground. So all that stuff at SRI, it just it, it took people like Jeff, Charles Irby and Bill Duvall and Bill English and so on, a whole bunch that made a huge difference. And in fact, it'd get to the point where sometimes they'd come to me and explain, hey, there's this thing called remote procedure called protocols, and we've got something like that really working now. So our lab gets credit for doing an early procedure called protocol, and somehow I get credit for it. And I said, I didn't even know what it was. <laughs> and so, so anyway, that, uh, so he's going to help me stay on a picture that we can do something about. And we've really got some specific plans and some really interesting things to, to launch with. Do you want to say something before we? Well, launch? no. We have a good two or three hour presentation here. Yes. <laughs> uh, and we're not quite certain which slides we're going to show. That's right. I couldn't get but, it together to throw away the right ones. But we're going to try it. So um, I think maybe a little bit more. Uh, ahead of time. Um, the SRI lab really was a pilot program, I think, in Doug's terms. And, and what we've been trying to do with the Bootstrap Alliance is get other people to get their pilot programs going. Because I think in one sense, Doug's vision of the future is not a vision of specifically where you're going to be or which devices you're going to use or whatnot, but it's a vision of getting a process going that puts discipline into this evolutionary idea. So uh, maybe if you'd go ahead and talk about pilot programs some, get us into that, then we can talk about some specific examples that we've got that are actually getting going. But go I just for it. can't resist showing you some of the pictures. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> OK. Um, <clears throat> and one, one of the things that you've been hearing a lot about is, OK, Revolutions coming. And so one of the real problems is how do organizations accommodate the changes that are coming like that. So, you know, up to now they've been sort of doing it, but wow, that's taking off. So the whole thing is, look, there's a huge challenge there for doing that. And one of the big things we talk about, about the potential, is the kind of a collective intelligence. So if you look at something that you could call a social organism, an organization, and realize that if you 
drew an envelope around it and watched how it interacts with the outside world, you'd pretty soon be able to get some sense about what kind of IQ it has in it. Like how well does it understand what's going on? How quickly and subtly does it make a decision? How well does it marshal resources and how smart a plan does it make? Da -da 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 -da. And so how well does it learn what's going on? And how well does it generate new knowledge and creative IQ? So the whole potential here that's been driving me for all these years is that, that there's a really a significant improvement in this collective IQ that's there to go after. But it won't, we won't go after it if we're muddling along with the way the market operates now. So that's one thing. And a big part of being collectively smarter is to have a dynamic knowledge-based knowledge repository in the middle that isn't just an electronic or digital library. It's something that's dynamic. And it's keeping track of the outside world. It's keeping track of what goes on inside. And it's almost always keeping as up-to-date as possible someplace you can go say, what's the summary now? And it's like having a, a constantly updated textbook or handbook about the state of things. Well, you say, this is the kind of thing that professional disciplines and academic disciplines are going to be like someday, much more dynamically up-to-date, and organizations can too. So it's just, if the potential's there, it's worth going after full speed. So we say, all right, that's the kind of push. And uh, so we say, all right, you start out. Go back. Pardon? Go, go back. back. I can't I'm go back. So, <laughs> so even, even back in the, in, the, in the films that you're seeing, the pilot program at SRI wasn't doing this about just anything in the world, but in fact was attempting to build this kind of not dynamic knowledge repository and tools about the things that we were building. That is, we were the, the core focus here to really get the leverage going was that we were building tools and building this dy dynamic knowledge repository about our tools and our dynamic knowledge repository, which is a very hard, e even today, to get, to get any sort of people doing software development to do that. But it was a key focus in what was going on here. OK. <laughs> It's, I, see, I really need support <laughs> and people to steer me. So uh, I should say thank you, Christina, for keeping on steering me and so on with other people, too. <laughs> like Christina is here, and, and so is one other daughter, and I think my son will be around. So if you see another Engelbart, placate them and say, great, thank you. <laughs> uh, so it's, uh, you know, you can't, you can't be single-mindedly staggering along year after year and really do justice to being a family man. So I sort of feel like apologizing. Anyway, <laughs> so that's why you can placate them, see? <laughs> um, so one of the stories starts, it's fundamental in here, is to say, you know, how does an individual or an organization, it's got some capabilities, a very important aspect of it to look at. Where do they stem from, the capabilities? Well, basically, they stem from the basic genetic human capabilities, right? So, so you bring in people that have been born and had no training or conditioning or equipping or anything. Are they worth anything in your organization? No. So he says, oh, well, we provide them with a few things. We say their facilities and their media to work in and tools and machinery and vehicles and et cetera, et cetera. And we call it a tool system. So absolutely. They need all that in order to be effective. Like you sitting in chairs and we've got facilities and da da da. So then the technologists sort of say, okay, then we bring in computers, huh? <clears throat> it says, no, wait a minute. There's another part of this that it takes to make people effective. It's the paradigms they live by, the procedures they follow, the customs they use, the language that they employ, the knowledge. All of these are added on top of the basic genetic capabilities and da 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 da. So there was no name for all this. So I just, Coined, crudely coined the name human system for that. And I'm still looking to say, is there any other term for it out there in the world? But it's the two of those two things integrated for humans to get trained, conditioned, taught, et cetera, in order to be effective. And it's, that's all that build on top of the genetic thing, motivation, everything else. That's all that gives them make effective. So he says, I'm going to improve their effectiveness. I'm going to invent some real gadgets here and plug it in. So there's never been an effective gadget that was plugged in over there that really made a difference until the human system adapted to it. 
anything like that. So big, big changes there cause subsequent fairly large evolutionary changes in the human system. You got a radical explosive change like the digital technology and you says, oh, I'm going to use it to automate things over here, huh? So this was the prevailing thing in the 70s. But, but that just can't be the, what happens. It's that that left-hand side, the human side, has got to co-evolve with lots of new ways in which it does things, which it, way it harnesses basic human capabilities in there. So we're talking about a revolution like we've never seen before. And it isn't going to be like you just sit there and have the equivalent of a document on your page and your screen and you scroll it, et cetera. Goes. That's not using anything of the computer capabilities or what your mind and your sensory and perceptual machinery can work with. There's just a revolution there in the making, but it's not going to go after unless we find ways to co-evolve those two things. So that's the term, all we thing we've been using, the co-evolving those two things. So we say, let's think of the equivalent of a frontier out there. This human tool system and human system, some combination of those for any organization. And you can say, well, there's a fairly primitive organization or society or something. Well, there's somewhat less primitive. Well, there, there are more. So if you started going around the world and cataloging them and trying to measure them on here, you'd find them, they spread around in some interesting way. And they finally get to your organization. And since you're modern and well-equipped, et cetera, you know you're going to be right up, up in there like that, right? So then you sit there through the years and you're saying, we're evolving. We know we need to move more towards what we can anticipate, the technology and tool system. And up here, yeah, but we're doing OK. And we send people to conferences once in a while and hire a consultant here. And we're moving in that space, right? So then comes a revolution, see? And it says, well, if that's the ten basic envelope, wait a minute. If maybe it's more like this, that this revolution has sneaked up on us and boom, there's this much change coming on there. Oh, now we have a different challenge from ever before for moving out there. And you says, well, OK, that makes a difference, doesn't it? Well, then you can meet some the thing like, where do you get the scenarios? How do you scout that frontier? How do you learn how to move through that much new space? And you say, wait a minute. What if it's that much difference? So now you talk to Engelbart, and that's what he says. <laughs> See, if it's, if it's stage one, you've got people who aren't going to worry, you know. Or stage two, well, it's happening, and the marketplace is going to help us adapt, et cetera. And he says, so that's the big story like that. So you think of this thing and you say, hey, whatever mechanism and infrastructure I had in my organization that was moving me out in that frontier is likely to be very inadequate now. See, that we're not even scouting it. We didn't have to have very much scouting done when it was moving so slowly, but now that becomes a huge factor. And then we didn't have to have so much specialty energy. The budget for moving our organization didn't have to be that high. Boy, now you've got to get big budgets and really know what to do. So the scouting and the moving are something that are just very important. And then we talk about if you're going to have, get smarter, get a better collective IQ, you know, you've got to look at your social organism like this to say, how does it work? And judging from it deals in the outside world, and it's got to have this repository. And you says, OK, that's the dynamic shifting of that is a key factor in there. So then you say, oh. Then we get a bunch of organizations together, and we've got the organization doing this everyday thing. We got activities in there that are trying to move the organization in space. We have some scouting activity, and look at the payoff if we get them together in a community that's helping each organization to move along a certain capability improvement vector. So this is the kind of idea of these evolutionary improvement communities that we got started. So the Bootstrap Alliance has set up the business to try to help that kind of institutional new way to set up for evolving. We call it an evolutionary or improvement infrastructure. So that's, that's the scheme that we're doing now. But it sort of says you want it to operate in a really prototypical advanced way too with this dynamic new repository, get tools. So it's a great chance to have advanced prototypes that work in there which leads to the whole thinking about advanced prototypes in there. And you says, all right, this, this thing is going to go. So uh, high performance teams are something that you want to think of to get into work. You say, hey, we want to explore. We ought to do some explicitly recruit, equip, and train 
as though for competitive performance assessment. That's, it's, it's a brand new thing to dump on you, but that's basic in there. And if, if we don't find ways to pursue that, how are we going to get learning about that frontier? And very new things, just invite them to be really far out and different. And strategically, it looks like the best place to employ them is in support teams inside of other organizations. So we say, great, they can be helping other organizations, but specifically those evolutionary communities. So all this is part of a framework, and it's like saying, in that frontier, we just have to find ways to get outposts that are for real, that aren't just toy things. We got some more technologies. We can try it out with some people for a while. So it's strategically, you're going to have to find out ways in which you can get advanced configurations of technology, not just one advanced gadget that's out here that doesn't change the... If you're going to try that human system balancing thing like that, you have to have pretty much a whole working thing. So this leads to saying they should be part of a bigger activity to do their high-performance thing in support of that, and then you come to things like saying, oh... Um, want to jump in and talk about the outposts. Do you want to jump in and talk Can about I jump outposts? in and talk about the outposts? Yeah. So I think, actually, one of the visions that goes all the way back, but it has really struck me, now that I'm at Sun, in the past 10 years or so, is that uh, science to do the tool systems is really sort of easy. I mean, we can build gadgets faster than even we can consume them. And the science to push the human system development stuff, from what I can tell, just isn't there. There's no disciplined way to go and get on these Moore's Law scaling curve things. So I think one of the key ideas Doug has had in this is the only way you can make a progression up the diagonal on this is through these pilot programs, to actually have experimental programs in the real world, doing real things, trying to push both dimensions simultaneously. It's, and and uh, in a way, it's that, it's that disciplined pushing up the diagonal, which I think is the part of the revolution that isn't going very strongly. <laughs> True. But well, we're going to talk about a couple little things we've got yeah. that are starting. If he can curb me from... <laughs> That's okay. Go ahead. <laughs> it's, you have no idea what, it, you know, all the years of thinking and planning and knocking on doors and such like this, and that for me, the absolutely unusual, mind-blowing thing of for Paul Saffo to put all this together today, to feel the energy, et cetera, it's just, um, just overwhelming. So we, we hope we can show some things about how, hey, there's an environment there we'd enjoy participating. And in particular, you know, the dynamic repository that any of this community, improvement community wants to do is be just the kind of thing to say, we need significant scenarios of the future. So if you listen to the next five guys talking today and just say, oh, wouldn't it be nice to take their visions and start integrating, cultivating them, and then cross-integrating them, et cetera, till more and more you bring in others and you could get some more and more coherent picture of what feasible futures might be? Because if we don't, there's no way to make scouting out or mapping this thing. Then you start doing intelligence collections and doing that. Then you start doing case studies. Then you start encouraging more and more of these things so that you really can learn. So we, we've... Uh, um, over the past, it's actually taken us close to a year, but just last month or so, uh, right. we had a very exciting thing. Uh, the Bootstrap Alliance Japan kicked off. Uh, it's really great. In fact, uh, Professor Ohashi is here someplace in the audience. Would you stand up, <laughs> Professor Ohashi? There he is, over here. Yes. Great. Sorry. Right. So, uh, uh, Make a point of meeting him later. Yes. Um, it's really wonderful. They've, they, uh, a number of people over there have organized and they formed a separate chapter of the Bootstrap Alliance and they bring a lot of very different Japanese values to this, which is, is great because they're very different than ours. Uh, but they're actually, uh, I think, in your terms, you could talk about this, getting into this notion of bootstrapping. It's a project where it's about it's about documentation and, and, and how to make the vast amounts of documents indexable and linkable better, but using the system in the development of the system. So maybe you'd say a little bit about relating that to bootstrapping. Sure. It's like uh, you say, I've got this infrastructure. 
that is setting up there to help improve the capabilities of organizations. Well, if some of those things improve capabilities that the infrastructure could use to improve its ability to improve, then the better you get at that, the better you're getting at getting better. Uh, simple? <laughs> See? And uh, so you say, why invent a term like bootstrapping? Well, it had been used many years before. The people would, when boots have straps up here that were very hard to put on, people would joke about you could hold them and lift yourself up in the air, see? So I heard about that when I was 14. I thought, boy, that's clever. But anyway, there were bootstrapping circuits. And then also, when computers started to be used, the term bootstrapping was applied to when you turn on the computer. And it's got only enough non-residual memory, or residual memory, to reach into the hard disk and bring enough enough that would bring in more data like that. It's booting, bootstrapping. That's the term booting came from bootstrapping. So, and, and one of the ways that, you, working with Japan, you understand they have a different notion about quality control and improvement that we just don't have in this country. Um, and in a way, I think that resonated with them a lot because there is a view of this that it, it, if you take a sort of a simplistic view that it, we're improving the way we improve the way we do things. And if what we focus on in this highest level improving the way we improve the way we do things is the improvement process, then we're really into a bootstrapping paradigm way of thinking something. See, there is a way. <laughs> and, you know, my formula is, well, I keep pointing long enough, I'll get people that are competent to start going there and getting it done. <laughs> and so this is, this is the kind of way it goes. It's, it's a funny joke why why I'm a very poor organizer, et cetera, but uh, I've been very lucky in the past, so can I show some more? Sure. <laughs> See, I'm I, watching the time. I really need people like that. So. <laughs> and so anyway, then uh, the, the really, really great, if you get teams that are really working to, to really learn about high performance, if you have them sitting off just doing their whole thing, one whole project or something by themselves, you're not really sharing it or using them as a lever to pry up more. So he says, look, the early ones, for a number of reasons, would probably be best applied if you had them be applied to support some other community organization, especially in the middle of their dynamic knowledge repository. So that says, OK, and you do that. And uh, so in developing and maintaining that would be a very important thing. And the special value of that comes if the business of integrating the knowledge. So as any time you're sort of really up to date with a coherent picture of what's going on up there like that, is isn't easy to do. So other disciplines and things, every once in a while somebody writes a textbook or something like that. Well, the way things are moving and all, that's got to be much more dynamic. So like that, it says, okay, so we'll have these guys do, oh, <laughs> these guys do that. And uh, so you also say, I'm going to need, they're working over the same materials, I need them to have one class of interfaces and other people have others. In fact, it'd be handy to have multiple classes. So we started building that into the augment system way back, that you could have different classes of how skillful the user were. You could have this kind of vocabulary or a simpler one, et cetera. So that and the interfaces all need to be done. So we uh, we really proposing that as a basic part of the architecture of something that you have to call an open hyper document system. So, and then we say, how would this go into universities? Well, the equivalent of a high performance support team is somebody that really high performance scholarship team. So any discipline or something like that, how are you going to keep it up to date, et cetera? So less and less can you depend upon the aperiodic way of appearance of a textbook, the way things are going. So these kind of collaborative tools and processes could make that be really up to date. And so this weekly or daily, how, how often do you think you need to update that? <laughs> Those are all part of the future in there like that. So here comes something that we want to talk about specific projects that are kicking off. You want me to talk? No, you talk. <laughs> the picture's there. Why don't you? It's your turn. Besides, you, you know how to do things. So, than I do. so actually, people may not realize it, but Doug is extremely active today, um, just continually pushing uh, uh, to get organizations involved. And we've gotten a number of them involved in the uh, Bootstrap Alliance. Um, 
a couple of the ACM organizations, some government agencies. Um, it's been sort of hard with companies. We have the National School Board Association. Yeah, but, but <laughs> we still have a hard time in the companies, right. uh, which is it really interesting in a way. If you, if you try to work inside the corporations and understand why they don't want to, why they have a hard time getting a pilot like this going and doing it inside their company. Um, but one of, the, uh, one of the things that has just started recently uh, is work that Doug started with SRI uh, that has some government funding behind it again uh, to, um, in a way, allow a number of pilots to start, I think, as a way to talk about it, uh, by starting an open source movement. It's sort of a Java, Java agent open source movement program so that maybe we could get enough infrastructure put together down on the software side to even get back to some of the things that have been in his systems over the years. But, but do it in the sense that we get a number of different pilots going rather than just the one. So that we get this diversity back. I think, personally, I feel a path we've gone down in the use of computers with the easy to use, GUI interfaces, mass population stuff has just ruined innovation in this whole field. And so. So maybe we can get some back again. So you should talk more about this. <laughs> this is great. Uh, yeah, there are, there are things you look at and say, uh, you know, like the what you see is what you get. And that's just sort of something that came up and people were very proud of it. Well, for a while it was good technology, but that became anchored into a sign of quality of something when it really is inhibiting very much trying to learn how you can really change the views and shift, see. So we'd really like to try that. And this is one of the things the higher performance teams could just break loose and go. And uh, I, think, so. I think this idea carries through in a lot of, a lot of your concepts. It was, it was, if I'm going to have a tool that I use a lot, not if I'm just a casual user that uses it a few minutes a day, but if this is my life, then it ought to be something that's tuned to me and that is extremely useful. And in fact, we were reminiscing in the back room. I think the 68 demo actually had 512 single keystroke commands, which weren't hard to learn. If you use this thing 12 and 14 hours a day, you actually knew them all. <laughs> and it made it go a lot faster. Um, and, and so again, but making an analogy we've made through the day, that's sort of down at the gadget level. I think one of the ideas you had is that you'd even start changing your language and the words that you use to refer to things uh, uh, so that you start talking with each other differently and writing differently about it so that, so that there's an evolution across the whole spectrum of, in a sense, tools that you have, not just the gadget tools. Right. There's hardly any really effective collaboration thing about what there have to be conventions you're going to adopt together the way you do things. And in this case, the conventions with which you tag your links and you point to things and you, there's just a, a whole bunch of stuff that will just grow so that, and what kind of properties are embedded in the document so that the simple kind of ones everyone has now will probably get more and richer. But you say, oh, the, the sort of straightforward pedestrian kind of user interface will just ignore that. And then if you get to a higher class of users, you'll be able to fly to manipulate things and such. So, so, so this open source stuff that, we're, that we want to push on, it's, it's sort of fun. Just recently, too, um, uh, we, we have an agreement with the open group, which is an um, open standard-oriented body uh, that actually comes equipped with uh, all the rules and regulations and ways of joining and whatnot so that corporations can take part and stay out of the intellectual property laws that, that keep a lot of us from working with each other. So we're sort of getting a, we're sort of, we, we barely have a kind of infrastructure together so that maybe we can get corporations back working in the open source community and contributing things and get this going. That, that's... Go ahead. <laughs> Well, when we talk about getting different capability evolutionary communities going, one, for instance, might be really on to how you do electronic commerce better, somebody else how you do distance learning better, somebody else on how you, you do your strategic intelligence better, et cetera, et cetera. They, they go after a particular kind of organizational capability 
that they build a community that wants to help foster. And so the, uh, the idea of having a multiplicity of communities, all of them sort of probing their way into the frontier actively, and you realize that if they start collaborating a lot, that'll help very much in mapping that frontier and good case studies, etc. So you want to get together in this kind of alliance and really invest in that kind of case studies, scenarios, experiments, exploratory things, so everybody can learn more about the scouting of that frontier and more about what it takes to move into it. Then each organization can decide for itself how it wants to move, that is, what kind of changes and what state and or degree it wants to do. But without having more visibility about that frontier, you know, Darwin's evolution is going to have a hard time going because there, you know, there'll be very odd sort of thing what sets the survival value of things that are changing if there isn't more of that kind of awareness in here. So this model is the best we could sort of paint out of what it, what it would be like and uh, that you have your communities and they have an evolutionary human system going on as part of their change and they need to employ evolutionary open source open hyperdocument system tools in order to work on the repository and that has to be based upon an evolutionary open hyperdocument system document standards because those document standards have to evolve in order to provide more power for how you use them the different properties and such that they'll have and the tools need to evolve so you look at what's evolving all around here you got three things at least the human system the tool system functionality oh thank you Doug <laughs> um, and the document standards so the, the idea of having that in a way so they're all open you can see all our human system things are trying there's open source for this and the open standards here so the World Wide Web Consortium has got a very active standards group here that if you get proactive organizations up in here can contribute a lot to how they might steer theirs and really if they're all participating in an open source way. So some of the communities will be ones that are actively involved in the actual source code evolution, etc. And they'll all be involved with questions about the functionality and the way they're applied. So it looks like a really neat thing to take off and we're looks like we're ready to sort of take off. So Jeff has all kinds of experience. <laughs> I've done the hard part of painting the picture, now he can do the easy part of making it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but to go back to one of the things we talked about this morning a little bit, the idea here is if, if we could really get the pilots going and get the revolution started this way, that there's a scaling effect that comes in. I think that's part of the grand dream. So to go through it once again, it, the idea is if, if these pilots were working right and the evolution was going on, then we would come up with ways of doing all of this so that if we had a group of 10 people and they had a certain capability, infrastructure, integrated tools, environment, certain capability for dealing, solving their problems, then when we go to a group of 20 people, we'd actually have three times the capability, not one and a half times the capability. So I think part of Doug's grand vision way back was that somehow if we could get these pilots going and get this learning process going on, the learning process would feed on another on itself and we'd actually get this built-in scaling effect um, and sort of ability to solve our small problems and our world problems because of the scaling effect. Absolutely. So it's a vision of the, so I think in a way his vision of the future is not so much one about what kind of gadgets we're going to have and stuff like that or exactly how the web is going to work but it's a project-oriented learning process to get the scaling built into this capability right. notion that we have, that we don't even have good words in the language about, which is a, a vision of the future that, that often the news reporters don't get into. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the big thing about that it's important to set up an evolutionary infrastructure that lets a sort of a free evolution take place and it's not no one approach can dominate unless it really proves itself better and you move that into the commercial world and you say some vendors approaching your organization and saying boy we've got this really hot sort of groupware etc cetera, etc cetera, thing that will make your organization just zing and, and then you're supposed to say 
well, that's great. Can I come and see? Oh, you bet, you bet. So what they think you mean is you're going to come and go into the demo room and have a fancy demonstration. And when you get there, you say, no, I want to see how your organization using this works so much more effectively like you told us. <laughs> and there'll be this big embarrassed silence. See, but this is the kind of thing user organizations should really start poking them at them and says, why the hell should we buy from you when you haven't even sold the rest of your company? Or you haven't sh can't show us. Don't tell us how we get better. Show us. So that's a big difference that this environment's just set up to say, that's the only way to do it. You got to come into the planners and movers and stuff to, you know, when they participate in this, the cooperative, you know, evolutionary communities are there to provide the experience and all so that they can show how to, to move. Your turn. My turn. Six minutes. Huh. You want a question from the audience? Do you want to keep going? That's dangerous. <laughs> but, all right. Paul? Paul's busy. We have uh, six minutes. Do you want to try questions? Uh, I think that would be a great idea. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to bring our quarterback out again, Bob. Um, and uh, oh, hell, we'll take a chance. Um, uh, yeah, come up a little closer. I'm not sure this is going to survive, and it doesn't behave like. <laughs> So what happens when the amount of information within the human system and the uh, open source, uh, open hyper document system is a million to a billion times more? What happens when Eric Drexler's nanotechnology, Eric uh, Drexler's <laughs> nanotechnology robots have crawled out over the planet and cataloged every blade of grass and every drop of, of pollution? What happens when everyone is wearing a, a $1 video camera and giving you live video feed from, from six billion people at once. What happens when we deal with that in an evolved way? That, that's a very good question and you just set me up beautifully. <laughs> See, the world is going to be much more complicated and challenging. So the deal of how are we going to handle that kind of challenging foosh like that are really collective issues. So somehow we have to be collectively get it with it enough that out of all that turmoil we can make a stable, healthy society. There's only there's no way except that collective way. And in the 60s, I almost gave up on this pursuit because, oh, the spiritual way and everything else, I look at that and say, you know, that's right. If we all got the right spiritual approach, we'd solve all these problems. And yet, getting people organized to do that, oh, that's right, that's a collective problem. Oh, I'm back, I better wear this collective hat again. So, thank you. <laughs> Question from the side? Wait, I'm going to keep it to the football. Cause, okay. It says talk over yeah, here. Yeah, pick the right end of the football. Okay. You, you talk here about how what we really need to do is we need to evolve tools and we need to evolve systems and we need to evolve uh, things. You just let it out there and see what grows. But at the same time, I hear a lot of uh, Microsoft Windows bashing. And that is, in some ways, the ultimate evolutionary system. How do you reconcile this? I couldn't hear all that. I, I, I meant some of it, too. I, I, I think the question was, um, evolution is fine, but if Microsoft Windows is an example of evolution, um, <laughs> is there something else? Is that a fair restatement? <laughs> That's, that was a fair restatement. That's not my opinion. I don't think we need to go Okay, deep we'll into duck that, that question. <laughs> um, <laughs> next uh, question, please. Uh, Bob, you pick them. Do a long pass, <laughs> deep. So it seems to me that the, the issue we're really not willing to address is not collective intelligence, but emotional intelligence. We're, we're still here 30 years later because we still haven't been able to address emotional issues of hate, love, greed, lust. When will we start to work on these problems? So, that's, you know, that's right 
right in there. Those are the kinds, the only way I can think of is doing it collectively, right? And it's terribly important. So one of the activists in our alliance has been somebody who was a very early promoter of the emotional IQ kind of thing. And it's, it's very critical, so yes, but, but how else are you going to approach it in trying to clarify and resolve and get a consensus about what to do with it and understand it? But somehow it's a collective process. The same with the environment, the same with many others. Are willing to agree that that is the topic. If we if we all applied our minds and our souls to solving the emotional problems and not the technolo te technological problems, I think we'd make much faster success, yes. much faster progress. I can't argue. I, I, and and if that's what the Bootstrap Alliance can do, sign me up. No. <laughs> I think there are a lot of venture capitalists who'd like to see some emotional intelligence. Uh, in the valley. Um, one last, <laughs> one last real quick question. Bob, you choose, and this is fast, and I want real quick question. Pick the right end. Uh, okay, I'm not sure how quick this will be, but well, be I, I'll okay. cut you off. Uh, can, uh, we all see examples of tool systems that are developing and evolving rapidly around us, and you're pointing out that the human systems um, need to, to evolve. And that's what the Bootstrap uh, Institute's all about. Can you give an example of an organization or a company that is applying these ideas to evolve their human systems? The best I can do is to give you some who are start, starting to sound sympathetic with the idea. But really, the, the, all you see in the journals and everything else is the drive with the technology side. And there are sociologists and people talking about the other. But unfortunately, sociologists and anthropologists are analytic sort of people, and they don't come in offering architectural support for making the changes. But somehow it has to go. So I don't know an example. I'm, I'm really sorry. But Shout it out. Here you go. Take the football. <laughs> One example. Shout it out. A website called addapt.org, adapt.org. And it's five or six companies who are, who've voluntarily given up some intellectual property rights to see natural selection occur in the interplay of ideas between them. And then they're free to compete on com commercial applications oh. of them. Good. Did you let us know about that? We'll, uh, yeah. we'll get that scribbled up uh, yeah. onto the site. Any final words? I would. <laughs> there are no final words. There are no final 30, words. 30 years. <laughs> well, thank you. an old man just crumble up and cry. So, <laughs> this, you know, I just can't tell you. Um, can't even talk. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
First, I want to run a brief video calculated to absolutely infuriate him. So if we could have the lights. <laughs> the lights in the video, please. Research team in Guatemala just checking in. Robert Jordan, a second semester junior, requesting a second extension on his term paper. And your mother reminding you about your father. Surprise birthday party next Sunday. Today you have a faculty lunch at 12 o'clock. You need to take Kathy to the airport by 2. You have a lecture at 4.15 on deforestation in the Amazon rainforest. Right. Let me see the lecture notes from last semester. No, that's not enough. I need to review more recent literature. Pull up all the new articles I haven't read yet. Journal articles only? Mm hmm fine. Your friend Jill Gilbert has published an article about deforestation in the Amazon and its effects on rainfall in the Sub-Sahara. It also covers drought's effect on food production in Africa and increasing imports of food. Contact Jill. I'm sorry, she's not available right now. I left a message that you had called. Okay. Let's see. There's an article about five years ago, Dr. Flemson or something. He really disagreed with the direction of Jill's research. John Fleming of Uppsala University. He published in the Journal of Earth Science of July 20 of 2006. Yes, that's it. He was challenging Jill's projection of the amount of carbon dioxide being released to the atmosphere through deforestation. I'd like to recheck his figures. Here is the rate of deforestation he predicted. Mm-hmm. And what happened? Hmm. He was really off. Give me the university research network. Show only universities with geography nodes. Show Brazil. Copy the last 30 years at this location at one month intervals. Excuse me, Jill Gilbert is calling back. Great, put her through. Hi Mike, what's up? Jill, thanks for getting back to me. Well, I guess that new grant of yours hasn't dampened your literary abilities. Rumor has it that you've just put out the definitive article on deforestation. Aha. Is this one of your typical last-minute panics for lecture material? No, 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 no. That's not until, um... 4.15. <sighs> well, it's about the effects that reducing the size of the Amazon rainforest can have outside of Brazil. I was wondering, um, it's not really necessary, but, uh... Mm, yes. <laughs> It would be great if you were available to make a few comments. Nothing formal. After my talk, you would come up on the big screen. And we have Ted Nelson to blame for this um, because it was his uh, phrase, hypertext, which he coined in the early 1960s that led a tortured path down to the minds of some people at Apple who invented that, the knowledge yuppie of the 1990s, <laughs> to show us. Um, but Doug's, or Ted's done some very interesting things on the way. In the 70s, he wrote the book Computer Live, which uh, I was actually quite a normal uh, undergraduate at the time, and I read the book and uh, it sort of messed up my life. I'm sure some of you in this room have had the same experience. He, of course, went on to start Project Xanadu, which is to hypertext what Gaudi is to cathedrals, um, <laughs> still underway. He is presently a visiting professor at Keio University and at the University of Southampton. 
deep into developing the hyper, uh, into developing Xanadu and some other things um, that are equally fascinating. Ted once said, um, also he's about to engage, embark in a new adventure for Ted. This is a first for Ted. This will be the first time in his career that Ted has only spoken for 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm hoping you all will help me encourage him to keep to his promise. Um, once I heard Ted say, a wrong time ago, I took a long turn. And it is absolutely true, and we are all deeply grateful that Ted got lost. Ted, it's all yours. I love and hate paper. I have more of it than anyone I know. Stanford University has asked for it. They don't know what they're getting into. <clears throat> but since childhood, I've been outraged by the imprisonment implicit in paper. Having to write to length because there isn't enough paper in the magazine or the book. Having to truncate lines of thought because they have just banged their nose on the right margin of the page. Having to stick to the subject, which of course always means sticking to the subject as someone else sees it. <clears throat> I believe there are no subjects actually in the popular sense because the word subject in the popular sense suggests sharp lines of demarcation, which is precisely what the mind should not be restricted to. So <clears throat> a little on background, I'll try to be quick. Uh, the mandatory story, because I'm not an engineer, I'm not a uh, computer scientist. Uh, I was going to be an intellectual slash showbiz guy. <laughs> at When I was 11, in the June, June 1949 issue of the Reader's Digest, I read about a guy named Buckminster Fuller, who had invented his own geometry, and I said, wow, you're allowed to do that? Hey, and he was my his... And I was keenly aware of new media. I grew up as a radio child. I still remember vaguely sitting on my grandfather's knee when we were listening to a symphony and the Pearl Harbor bombing was announced. I also remember playing with my trains with the radio on and hearing the news of Hiroshima, which I conveyed to my grandparents. At the age of 12, about, I sat behind my father, who was a director in the early days of live TV, one of his greatest moments. It was a show called Mama, a comedy show, a family comedy show at 8 p.m. on Friday night, sponsored by Maxwell House Coffee. And uh, there was no videotape, there were no retakes, and camera one went out on the opening shot. And flawlessly and seamlessly, he talked the whole thing through on the microphone, and nobody knew anything had gone wrong. It was magnificent. At the age 13, I read a book called The Voyage of the Space Beagle by A.E. Van Vogt, and this was narr the narrator said he was a nexialist, someone who finds connections. And I typed up little business cards calling myself a nexialist. <laughs> and about the same time, a movie opened with an astonishing storyline because it was one story told six times over. I think I saw it three times. The year was about 1950 and the film was called Rashomon, pronounced uh, Rashomon by most Americans, but essentially about uh, versioning. Uh, <laughs> about the fact that there are many stories in the big city and you'll never know which one is correct. So you have to tell them all. <clears throat> in college, I, I majored in extracurriculars. Uh, by the time I got out, I, I don't say I did, I'd done these things well, but I had produced an LP, I'd made a movie, I'd done the world's first rock musical in which Van Damme played a spy. <clears throat> I had uh, uh, done newspaper and magazine stuff, and uh, the fighting over creative control seemed to me the center of the universe. We had, at dress rehearsal, we had a fight. Uh, my stage manager and I, and he said he was gonna, we we're gonna do this his way, and I walked off, and 10 minutes later I came back and he capitulated. His name was David Baltimore. I don't know if he's still in show business. In any case, <clears throat> 
Okay, outraged, outraged by the confines of paper and the problem of version management and ever-changing versions, whether it's a script or a seminar paper that's due at 9 a.m., how do you manage the swirl of ever-changing thought and different ideas? How do you keep track? I was trying to keep, I was resolved to take notes and understand more than most people did. And how express minority views? There are minority political parties, minority religions, which are satirized in the press, and you can never find out what they actually think. And finally, and most important, the individual's fight for creative control versus the obtuse, shallow, and conventional majority. Okay. So, unable to decide between intellect and show business, I went to graduate school and, and there took a course in computers. Bang, lightning bolt, heavens open. <clears throat> it was all obvious. Because, you know, I, at the age of 11, I saw people, men suddenly working at screens in darkened rooms. There's, we're going to change. This is the next thing. And for the rest of human life, we will be working at screens. And so the question is how to design tomorrow's, what will replace paper for tomorrow. But it had to be better than paper. It had to do everything paper did and be better. For example, everything has to be annotatable. So I started designing. This was 1960. The problem is, what most people still don't understand yet, all documents are parallel. Consider a well-known example, the Bible. What is the Bible? Well, it begins with the Hebrew Torah. And wait a minute, there's that nifty Hebrew Torah that just came out of Ethiopia that's only, what, the first four books? <laughs> uh, they separated early. Uh, and then there are the different translations. And then there's the New Testament. Thousands of different translations. And consider the subtle differences between the, New Te between the, uh, the Douay version, the uh, King James version, the, this version and that version all of which essentially have important differences from a theological point of view. Now, what is the Bible? It's all of them. Now, some people may only want you to see one version. <laughs> but the whole point, <laughs> the whole point is the Bible is all of them and being able to see them side by side. Now, even in the 50s, they, they had the interpreter's Bible, which is printing the Bible side by side. Okay, Shakespeare, Rashomon, it's all one. Okay, that's, so that was the first epiphany. Second epiphany, interactive software. Software is going to be interactive on screens. And what is the computer screen? I, mean, I, I was frozen. I saw a picture in Datamation of a map. This is 1960, a map on a computer screen. Holy smoke, this is going to replace the printing word. And once we do that, what does it become? Well, obviously, interactive software is a branch, I'll put it the way I state it now to my classes, interactive software is a branch of movie making. This is not a metaphor. This is not an analogy. Interactive software is a branch of movie making, and virtually most computer science is irrelevant. What is relevant is studying your Wells, studying your Hitchcock, studying your good documentaries. Because <clears throat> right now we're in the stage of software which compares to the movie business before 1904. Between 1892, say, and 1904, movies were made by the cameraman because he understood the equipment. And that's exactly where we are now. Thank you. Thank you. In 1904, they invented the director. The direct, what was the director? It was the guy who didn't have to know how to load, load a camera, didn't have to know how to sew costumes, play a violin, dance, fence, or hang the lights. But he had to know how to make those effects come together in a unified experience. Now, very simple rhetorical question for you. Why are video games so much better designed than office software? The answer is preposterously simple. Video games are designed by people who love to play video games. <laughs> Office software is designed by people who want to do something else on the weekend. <laughs> now, what does show business teach you? It teaches that you that design is war. <clears throat> Design is war. It's a power struggle between the producers, the directors, the authors, everybody who's going to be involved. And now we see it in the following form. What is the software business about? The software business is about the politics of standardization and almost nothing else.
so that <clears throat> all the politics comes down to this one thing. Now, how did we get, for example, Eisenberg Kingdom Brunel in 1820 said, if we had railways where the, where the two tracks were 20 feet apart, we'd be able to drive those, those trains at 200 miles an hour and they'd be smooth. And he was right. He also knew that ships could be made of iron. Nobody believed him. But what happened? Uh, according to the one version I heard, uh, the opposite party's men came around and got his, uh, his workmen drunk the night before the, the uh, Queen's or King's uh, uh, inspection party. And the result was that we got the present railroad standard, where the railroad width of the two tracks is the same as the distance between the wheels of the Roman chariots, uh, for traditional reasons we needn't get into. Okay. So the problem is always, how do you establish the standards? It, and, and everybody has been worked on something better. Everybody in the field, computer field with four years of experience, has worked on something that is better than what's out there now, right? <clears throat> but the problem is, how do you get your standard down? And the great line that you have to know from Hollywood, <clears throat> everybody wants to direct. So how, who gets to direct? Who gets to make those decisions? And right now, it's committees designing the software, and the guy who does some difficult subroutine gets to do the little interface pop-up for that. And, <clears throat> and what we have is uh, today's garbage. Now, so <clears throat> uh, I try to explain to people in 1962 or three that, that you know, we would be reading and writing on screens, it would be hypertext, and the copyright issue would be solved because the original quote would be bought from the original publisher and come instantly, and, and I would, I never talked slowly, and uh, people would, there'd be a long pause and people would say, is it like a tape? <laughs> and only years later did I realize that the answer is, yeah, it's like a tape. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, I visited Doug in the summer of, uh, I guess, the spring of 1967, because we talked about my coming out to work for him. And, uh, and uh, two things on that trip, well, several. One was, I just love the guy, of course, as everyone does. And uh, then I saw the mouse. Well, till, up till then, I thought it would be light pens. No, hey, well, obviously, this mouse thing was much better. And also, next door, there was a place that sold skateboards. And I thought, oh, wow, I'm going to ride skateboards. So uh, <laughs> one of those came true. I, I, I skateboarded a little while in my 30s, but I quit. <clears throat> but the thing about Doug was that his emphasis on collaboration seemed to me completely naive. I've always been very sensitive to conflict, and, uh, <laughs> and the notion that, that, there, that, that you can bring agreement to people, agreement between people is a miracle, okay? <laughs> and it, it has nothing to do with loving them, right? <laughs> does, does, does really loving somebody mean you get along with them well? Okay, <laughs> so, but one of the things, one of the things that moves me greatly is seeing this audience here because it shows that the emphasis on collaboration and on working together does have a meaning, can have results, and I'm learning that also working with people in Japan. Okay, so <clears throat> the other side of it, of course, is still how to empower the dissenter and how to empower the person who wants to package the material differently. Because, right, because in the old world of media, every information package gets the lid nailed on shut, you can't reuse it, you can sort of point to it vaguely from all sides. Now, <clears throat> skip that. Talk a little about today's horrible computer world. Uh, to quote Eric Raymond, Microsoft is not the problem. Microsoft is the symptom. So the problem is, how do we alert people's intelligence to what can be, rather than taking it down to the lowest possible common denominator? And this, of course, is the center of Doug's work. Today, uh, paper. We've got to have media which are better than paper. But let's just begin. You can flip through paper. Opening a file on a computer screen is like opening a packing crate. There, <coughs> the, 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 the hierarchical assumption of structures in today's software. We, we have hierarchical directors which he accidentally invented like in 1947. Where are we going to put all this stuff? Well, let's make a file which is the names of files, right? So the hierarchical assumption has passed on to us, which assumes that there is no overlap between things we do. You work on one thing, 
and then you finish that, and you put it away neatly, and now you work on something else. <laughs> right? There is no overlap, there is no interpenetration. Projects are never redefined. We don't have to change our terminology once we've started. <clears throat> In other words, today's software was, bought, was designed by and for clerks and engineers, but not for people who think or who are paid to think. <laughs> uh, pardon me. <laughs> uh, let me restate that. <laughs> not for people who are incessantly plagued by problems of rethinking. Okay. Now, the Macintosh and the PC, to me, this is Tweedledum and Tweedledee, okay? And, and, and it, it masks this, this so-called GUI. I would rather call it the PUI, the Park User Interface, because <coughs> <laughs> there are so many millions of graphical user interfaces possible, and yet we are stuck with one in which we have a single fixed little area called the desktop. I don't know why. I've never seen a vertical desktop. And <coughs> where... Uh, where the icons are a fixed size and then they open to flat windows which don't have any perspective, blah, 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 and they don't connect. So, calling to me, calling a hierarchical director a folder is like calling a prison guard a counselor. <laughs> now, as, as Zimbardo demonstrated a few hundred feet from here on the Stanford campus, uh, anyone will behave like a prison guard under circumstances that uh, put you in control of people like a prison guard. And, and hierarchical directories create uh, truncated and, and, and cut up thought. Word processing is a geek's notion of what writers need in the same way that MIDI is a geek's notion of music. You see, in both cases, misled by the notation, oh, those are characters on a page. We'll just have the characters on a page. And, and those are just notes on paper. Well, we'll just play those notes. Okay, so now we get MIDI and we get word processing. Whereas the problem in writing is the duality of text between the items, the items you wish to include and whose position you wish to track from version to version, and you want to make sure you get in and you want to make sure you reused, and the surface structure, which is the knitted sentences resulting from those ideas, those items projecting upward. Okay, so we have forever this duality. Doug understood that from the beginning, uh, merging outline processing and, and, and text, but that's just the beginning. Now, this profit without honor business is all con completely true, but I was misled by the, by, this, by the old slogan, in the country of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. The, uh, the real slogan ought to be, in the country of the one-eyed, the two-eyed man better watch himself. <clears throat> and, you know, and uh, because people don't like your perspective. So, and, and the, the lack of appreciation of Doug, it's like, you stand next to the Empire State Building, you don't know how tall it is. You just know that it's taller than you, and a lot of people resent that. <laughs> and so just to keep standing, for somebody like Doug to keep standing with all the disappointments and, and, all, the, and all the crud is just a remarkable and wonderful achievement. I'm very, very happy he's here. See, the software industry and, and the understanding of software is not merely about <clears throat> the blind men and the elephant. It's the blind venture capitalists trying to take parts of the elephant public. <laughs> like this trunk thing, can it give us a three-year exit strategy? Uh, <clears throat> integrated software. Well, Doug knew from the beginning that software had to be integrated, but most people, it's, it's like trying to explain the idea of cuisine to someone who's only eaten at McDonald's, okay? So, you know, let's say cuisine, let's see, what would be that be? You'd, you'd, you'd put the, uh, the fries and the, and the burger and the shake next to each other on a tray. Or you could, you know, be really radical and, and, and dip the fries and the burger in the shake. <clears throat> and, um, that's windows. And... <laughs> Or you could put the burger on your head, put the french fries up your nose, and pour the shake over your head. That was called Lotus Symphony. 
I finally found out, <laughs> I dearly love Mitch Kapoor, but I finally found out how, how uh, Lotus Symphony was actually designed. <laughs> it's true. I had dinner with um, Ray Ozzy, who created Lotus Symphony, and apparently inspired by a conversation we had that I don't even remember. And, uh, and he said, uh, he was working for Mitch at, at Lotus, and he said, okay, I'd like you to back my idea. And Mitch said, okay, I'll make a deal. Here's the Lotus wish list, the things we've had requested by customers. Will you implement it exactly as stated? Okay. So Ray programmed this very carefully, exactly according to the list, and got backing to develop Lotus Notes, and the list was released as Lotus Symphony. <laughs> That's software design for you. But now you see we're in this era of, of paper simulation. Again, WYSIWYG, Doug already mentioned WYSIWYG. WYSIWYG, you see, it's one of those misleading, misleading terms. It's like, uh, uh, what you see is what you get. What do you mean? What are you talking about? What I see is what I see, right? And I'm getting it, right? No, not quite. Because, you see, what it really means <laughs> is we're using it, what you get when you print it out. In other words, we are tying your activity to the destiny of paper. We are using the computer as a paper simulator, which is like tearing the wings off a bus, of, of, of 747 and driving as a bus on the highway. <laughs> now, the usual story is that this evolved from at, at Xerox Park because they wanted to uh, make computers simple for the man in the street. Actually, the truth is they did it because they wanted to make computers clear, the idea of cl computers clear to Xerox management. <laughs> <laughs> Xerox was a paper walloping country, company, and they understood paper. So the whole point was to use the, the image they have. And so that like, the, like the Roman chariot uh, creating the width of the, uh, of the tracks, the Xerox upper management mindset has created today's computer system. Just think of all the imaginary forests we've had to cut down to create the, the simulated paper on the screens. But what's worse? <laughs> what's worse is that we are stuck in that prison of paper, those four walls. So <clears throat> let's, go, let's go to the slide, please. <laughs> Can I have the first slide? Thank you. This is a slide which I published. I published this in 1972 at, in, the, in the proceedings of a conference. This is the mock-up of how computer windows should look. 1972, which I believe was a couple of years before the design of today's uh, uh, prevailing windows at Xerox Park. So we should have, we should be able to point out the connections of the contents of one window from another window. So you can write your commentaries. You can show your links explicitly, point to point. We've got to have that. People would say, "Oh, Ted, you don't understand how computers work." <clears throat> Wrong context of discourse. This is how computers must work. And if it's not convenient for you, buddy, it's time. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I, let, let me get in here. I, uh, okay. well, <laughs> so, all right. You put that yeah. On? All right. So here we go. Put this on. Put this on. <laughs> okay. A word about education. <laughs> people ask me, is your stuff useful for education? The question is, which do you mean by education? Do you mean the process by which people become educated? Great. Do you mean the educational establishment? Thank you, no. Because actually you buy the farm, oh, that's the wrong expression here. <clears throat> The moment you establish a curriculum, you've lost it. Do you know what curriculum means in Latin? It means, and this is not well publicized, it means little racetrack. Okay, so as soon as you have a curriculum, you have winners and losers, right? And you have a schedule so that the curriculum creates the educational system in exactly the same way that the time slot creates broadcasting as we know it. Okay. So here on the screen, this is a close-up of my proposed windowing system. We will now go, <clears throat> control C, double click. We will now go, this was a mock-up done in 1960. How do we get out of this, guys? 
Thank you. Okay. So now let's now let's look at the um, let's look at the. Yeah, there we are. Okay. So this was done, by the way. With, I did. In, this was programmed in, uh, by Professor by Dr. Ian Heath at the University of Southampton, according to the specs for my 1972 system. So this is how Windows look today. Yup. There they are, okay. <laughs> Windows. <laughs> this is how they ought to look. And these link connections should be able to follow the material as you scroll so that we can actually start to write connections on material that can follow the real interconnections of the material and not be confined to the four walls of Windows as we now have them. Okay. So, two cheers for the web. <clears throat> the web is intrinsically broken. It doesn't have version management, it doesn't have rights management. And the reason, I find, all too late I read a paper that explains why uh, the web beats Xanadu. It's an article by Richard Gabriel written in 1987 called uh, Good News, Bad News, and How to Win Big on Why the Thing that Does the First 50% Flashily Wins in Software. Trying to, but try to, and try to add version management and rights management to HTML is like trying to graft arms and legs on a hamburger. <laughs> okay. So I will leave the last word to Doug in this little video clip I made six years ago. potential out there for humanity and, and uh, once you get a picture of that potential being very much more than what you see and you think that there's a way to get there uh, then it's very hard to set that aside to do something that is uh, more practical you might think but I really think that the world you know, humanity could climb a really effective ladder to a lot more capability human potential and I, I think we could go at it with the right strategy. That, so that's what I, I get committed to somehow. I can say is you should see the two-hour version. He was just getting warmed up. Um, there, a, a, a gentleman here on the campus, uh, a physicist named Edward Teller, um, was once having a conversation with him, and he told me there was there was something about Hungary. Um, there, it turned out that there was one high school that a disproportionately large number of scientists who were on the Manhattan Project all came from, and. One wonders what was going on in Hungary at the time. Well, one wonders what was going on at Swarthmore College in the early 1960s, because uh, both Ted Nelson and our next presenter, Andy Van Dam, both were at Swarthmore at the same time, and both have had fascinating collaborations over the years. Um, Andy is uh, currently and has been for some time the T.J. Watson Professor of Technology and Education and a Professor of Computer Science at Brown University, a department that he helped establish. Um, like Ted, he is fascinatingly visionary. He has pushed farther on the edges of the intersection of hypermedia and education than anyone else. Um, he has one disqualification, though, from being a true visionary. He can actually complete projects. Um, it's a, but, but I think when you hear Andy talk, you will not hold that small defect against him. Please join me in welcoming Andy Van Dam and his colleague Rosemary Simpson. 
So uh, I want to thank you, Paul, for uh, letting me take part in this wonderful celebration of Doug and his fabulous team and of the mother of all demos. I don't think we'll see anything like that for decades, probably. But I've got to ask, what have I ever done to you to have to go on after Ted Nelson? <laughs> you just saw a new medium, folks, that stand-up techno-comedy. I first want to start off by thanking my uh, co-pilot and navigator here, Rosemary Simpson. Uh, she's going to be trying to put the pieces of this show together in an article, much as she did for the Bush Symposium that we ran at MIT three years ago. And a host of other folks at Brown uh, who helped me put this pitch together. Well, let me take a look very briefly at a 50,000-foot level at Doug's revolution and ask where has it succeeded? And I'll say to a first approximation, it has succeeded for knowledge workers from schools on up to industry and to government. We all use word processing, never mind the limitations. We all have some understanding of what a bootstrap community is. We have shared whiteboard software, and we've begun to learn about augmenting human intellect. But where the revolution has not at all succeeded as far as I'm concerned, not even in the tiniest bit, is in education. I was at a meeting last week where Rita Caldwell, the new director of NSF, spoke, and she said she had only one message. It's K through 12, stupid. And that was a very interesting thing to hear the director of the National Science Foundation, a research foundation, say. Well, I'm here to talk a little bit about why I think it's finally time for this revolution to get underway in this particular area. I've believed that education is the killer app since 1962 when I taught my first course to high school students and high school teachers. And the thing that really made me believe that computers could do it was, of course, Sutherland's landmark film on Sketchpad, which got me to go into computer graphics. And I have to say, Ivan is the other father of our revolution. And then I learned, yes, indeed. And then I got converted to the notion of hypertext by Ted, whom I met at a chance meeting. And I saw instantly that the combination of these ingredients was the right way to go for multimodal learning. I contrast multimodal to unimodal, which is what I enjoyed in college. For example, I studied fluids, and I had a big, thick textbook filled with text and equations and exactly one picture. It was on the cover. No geometric intuition at all. Ted, of course, had it right again. If computers are the wave of the future, the displays are the surfboards, and boy, are we surfing on the web today. Let's take a look at what some other visionaries have said about various kinds of gadgets that they invented or used in education. Thomas Edison thought the answer was the vi visual medium and the projector that he invented did not replace textbooks. Benjamin Darrow thought it was going to be radio, the textbook of the air, a wonderful phrase, but again, it didn't happen. Here's what Ted had to say in a wonderful anti-C, classical CAI, the drill and kill, now Johnny school of software, uh, in which he talked about computers and choice and talked about a magical space, the sort of magical space that Ivan visualized, for example, in his AFIT paper in 1965 about virtual reality. Let the student control the sequence. Responding resources, that's where it's at. Seymour Papert. We'll go back here for a second. Also about computers and choice, starting with logo and constructivist theory and thinking, he visualized that there would be a deconstruction of curricula in just the sense that Ted talked about it and of schools, and that hasn't happened for better or for worse. By the way, Mindstorm's Lego, get into it, it's amazing. We've done a variety of projects since I started on this in 66, 67, not all under my direction, and the last one done by a spin-off company. We're a little out of sync here. It was the Alan Kay. 
I would okay, let's go back. I, I, go back to Alan. Yeah, let's go back to Alan. I absolutely do not want to leave out Alan here. Hugely important. The responding resource, the Dynam book, based on simulation, that's at the key of what we're talking about in education today. And fortunately, Alan's vision and that of others is finally being realized today. So a bunch of these projects at Brown, we tried and we too failed in a major way. Now, I'm being cynical, but I want to tell you I'm being cynical in the Oscar Wilde sense of being a cynic, which is a frustrated idealist. Like Ted, like Alan, like Doug, I really believe in this stuff, and sooner or later, it really is going to happen. So, summarizing, here's a little bit of pseudocode that you can apply to just about every technology, except for the real successes, the only two educational technology tools, books and chalkboards, now whiteboards. Okay, not quite charitable enough. We've had partial successes. Uh, there is, of course, use of film strips and movies and television, the Apple II logo. Those all did have an impact. But still, in 83, in a nation at risk, we wrote about unilateral educational disarmament. In 1997, the Shaw Report, uh, which was done by the President's Committee of Advisors on Science and Technology, says that technology in a period has fundamentally transformed America's offices, factories, and retail establishments, but its impact within our nation's classroom has generally been quite modest. Now why? The usual suspects and I won't have time to go through this, social problems like dysfunctional or non-existing families, crime, poverty, and so on, they dominate. So when we try to think about educational tool fixes, we should remember where the hardest problems lie. Conservatism is a big issue. We do need radical change, and conservatism comes very difficult to our society. I love this Machiavelli quote, I just gotta read it to you. It must be considered that there is nothing more difficult to carry out, nor more doubtful of success, nor more dangerous to handle than to initiate a new order of things. For the reformer has enemies in all those who profit by the old order, and only lukewarm defenders in all those who would profit by the new order. This lukewarmness arising partly from fear of their adversaries, who have the laws in their favor, and partly from the incredulity of mankind, who do not truly believe in anything new until they have had the actual experience of it. That's a human characteristic, and we really need to pay attention to that. As much as possible, we ought to mock up and let people get experiences. There is no panacea, but there is reason to believe that we can be excited again. I list a couple. Next. Moore's Law, which we've heard a lot about today, makes visual communication possible. It gives us the vividness and immediacy that were predicted for movies and radio, plus the big one, interaction. Graphing calculators have had impact on the way that calculus is taught in high schools and in freshman year college. Dynabooks are finally arriving, not just your laptops, but much smaller things designed specifically for reading, rocket books, soft book, some standards. Yes, I believe they are a necessary evil are being gathered based on HTML, bleh, XML, a bit better, so that we get some interoperability between these electronic books. And we have the web and Java applets, just-in-time learning, wonderful for lifelong learning, which is what we're all going to be doing, and allows us to get away from TED's track curriculum for students and teachers to configure their own courses and units from a set of components that they can find on the web. As Howard put it this morning, it isn't connecting schools to the internet, it's about teacher education. By the way, ever notice teacher training is the buzzword used, and driver's education. So let's just call it professional development of the teacher core. And it's the content, stupid. We haven't had excitement because we haven't had, to a first approximation again, exciting content. And that's what we're trying to do a little bit about at Brown as well as other places. Our focus has been on the use of electronic books and their components. And the electronic book, as far as I'm concerned, should have three pillars. 
It is, of course, an interactive dynamic repository in the way that the pioneers have written about and showed us for years. I won't be talking about the hypermedia aspects today, nor about the knowledge base. I profoundly believe that books should be able to interact with us through intelligent agents, uh, intelligent tutoring systems, intelligent CAI in its infancy, but someday it will get somewhere. I can't work on that. What I do want to work on is interactive illustrations, hypergrams, Dynabook illustrations, whatever you want to call them. If a picture is worth a thousand words, a moving picture is worth a thousand static ones, then surely an interactive, user-controlled, dynamic picture is worth a thousand ones that you watch passively. That's what we're working on. We call them exploratories these days because they combine the best of the exploratorium where you're free to roam and experiment with some degree of guidance that you get from a laboratory exercise. Explorable worlds that have behavior. Allen's vivarium, which by the way now has a commercial implementation in near life, which is shown at various science museums. Learning by doing, by experimentation, by investigation, by discovery, and of course embedded in a hypertextual framework. What we do is work with the children's crusade model that I have used since I got to Brown in the mid-60s. Undergraduates are wonderful designers and implementers, and we, with more experience, give them some guidance, but we basically let them run. We have lots of constraints on us dealing with the heterogeneity and the fact that largely these are still fairly unformed workers. So we have to teach these wonderfully gifted amateurs. We have to teach them programming, instructional design, pedagogy, user interfaces, graphics design, and of course, the subject matter. Our implementation strategy is to test on ourselves to form a Dag Engelbart style bootstrap community. We use Java Beans and IBM's Visual Age right now as commercially available tools. We no longer have much energy for tool building. And the thing that I think makes our approach a little bit different and I hope unique, in fact, is that we're really trying to mine our experience and produce a handbook. Somebody this morning, I forget who it was, said, we need to update the community's knowledge in a handbook. Bingo, that's exactly what we're trying to do, codify. So far, we've only gotten to the, part, to the part of dealing with software and process design patterns. And notice I'm using the word pattern in the Alexander sense of pattern or the Gang of Four design patterns book. We're very fond of patterns at Brown and we teach them starting in my freshman Java class because we think they are so important. Now, we also want to get at some point to learning which kind of pedagogical strategies work and why and incorporate those in patterns. Okay, let me uh, tell you a little bit by showing you some of the ones that have been created by our undergraduates this past year. They come typically in clusters and can build on each other in various combinations. Are embedded in hypertext, I demo during the course of my classroom experience, and then people experiment afterwards. Let's look at a couple. First one is on color mixing could be used just fine with high schoolers or even fifth, sixth graders. Here is some text that is embedding the concept and here is the applet. Okay, so at the top right we see additive light sources and I could put light bulbs of various color in there. In the middle we see a canvas which the light will be reflected off and I can color the canvas with various light absorbing pigments, paints. And then I can insert a gel filter from a bunch of ones on the bottom left in the filter box. And then the question is, what does the human eye see? So we'll start with magenta, which is a mixture with red and blue. And we'll put that on a white canvas, which will reflect all of the incident light. So magenta in, magenta out, and the user sees magenta. Now we'll add green. Magenta, red, and blue plus green to a first approximation makes white. So white bouncing off white produces a sensation of white. Now we're going to start doing a little subtractive color. We'll paint with magenta paint. There's no such thing, but let's do that right now. And that should reflect only things that are in that frequency spectrum. And so we get a magenta sensation. And the last thing we'll do now is insert a blue filter 
if we have white coming in on the canvas and only red and blue going out as magenta and the blue is only allowing blue light to come out, then that's what we'll see. Okay, let's look next at the signal processing applet. There are about 25 of these and I have the job of taking something that's pretty tough mathematically for sophomores who've not had a course in linear systems, filtering or anything like that, and try to create what we've been doing for a very long time at Brown, which is to produce some geometric intuition. The BALSA system done by Sedgwick and Brown did algorithms that way. First you get geometric intuition, then you look at the math mathematics and the code. So that's what we're doing here. Embedded in some textual explanation, Rosemary is drawing some function in the spatial or in the temporal domain. She's going to apply a triangle filter. And what we do first in convolution is to take a product of those two functions at a particular position of the uh, filter function. And then you can see that product in the third window. And at some point she will produce a result where there is about as much below the axis as above the axis. We take that product and that becomes one data point in the integral and if we sweep the filter over the entire line we then produce the actual convolution and the result of sweeping this not bad filter over this pretty choppy signal is that we get a smoothed out version. So what the student does is play with various filter shapes, various functions, and understand the individual components that go into convolution. And as I said, this is part of a long line of them. Okay, so much for some quick demos. Let me quickly take you through the thing that I think is actually most important about what we're doing, which is this capturing of experience in the handbook. We have a very preliminary handbook. It has four sections, planning, design, software engineering, and evaluation. We found that when we started instructing our undergraduates, we gave them way too little guidance. Most of them had never designed anything before. So the templates that we gave them were insufficient. We're now trying to give them a much richer knowledge base on how you do these kinds of applets. So we'll just show you a very little bit of it. Demo be willing. So we'll scroll through a bunch of stuff that I can't read from here. Various sections, uh, planning, design. Let's go to design, Rosemary. And in there, let's see, you even made me a cheat sheet. Let me go refer to paper. Uh, let's go to the storyboard section. Okay, this is just an example done by one student for the benefit of her colleagues. Okay, then let's go to the interface guidelines. And an important part of these handbooks is what did we do wrong? How did we evolve? And there's quite a bit on how we do vector mathematics illustrations here that says here's what we tried, here is what it didn't work, and here's what we like now. It's simpler, it's easier to understand. Okay, that's what we're doing now. Let's talk a little bit about the future. Now, I think we're tracking a moving target. We're all to a first approximation, still very much locked into the desktop metaphor and desktop computing. It's brought great benefits, but it also, as was observed earlier, has constrained our, our thinking. What should we be thinking about even for the near-term future? Well, here Thad Starner for MIT's wearable computing group is wearing glasses in which there's LCD projection of a perfectly readable VGA resolution screen on his left glass. And on the bottom right, you see somebody wearing wearable computers. These things are in research labs transitioning into the real world. Multimodal interfaces where we talk to our computers the uh, Knowledge Navigator, which I think is actually a fabulous vid video. I think uh, there are lots of things right with it as well as things wrong with it. Uh, we'll be able to talk to our computers in limited ways. We are working very heavily at Brown at the combination of gesture, both for two-dimensional and three-dimensional tasks integrated with speech. Other people are working on more passive uh, things where you're not wearing anything and video is watching you. and 
That is going to be just a terrific way of working. Now, you know when you're being watched because you're going into a specially instrumented room. This is not surveillance. That's not what I'm talking about. Then high bandwidth is coming our way, and that will facilitate tele-immersion. Jaron will, I'm sure, tell you more about that. That's being there with other people. Collaboration is a theme that you've heard a lot of today. Here is one vision that I think you ought to be aware of. This is Henry Fuchs predominantly, University of North Carolina, a real pioneer in display technology and virtual reality technology. And he and his group are working on office virtual reality brought to you courtesy of cameras and projectors, all cheap in the ceiling. The cameras are calibrating every pixel, every so many microseconds at every location in the room. And constructing a depth map of the entire room in real time so that as things change in the room, that is being captured. With that kind of information, you can project not just on walls, on special devices, but anywhere in the room. And what you can do is pipe remote environments to any particular place and create a shared work or play environment. Here you see Henry and colleagues designing the next generation head mount display, which is one of Henry's uh, specialties, and lifelike avatars are being brought to you by this technology, and the idea is to make it cheap and not to make it something that is special and lives in research labs only. So these are the kinds of environments that we're going to go into in the future, and I think that is going to have to force a paradigm shift in the way we think about applications. In architecture, you learn that form follows function, I claim that function should follow form and that when you get these new form factors, you really have to think in a new way about what an app is. Apps will not be what they have been today. We need new idioms, metaphors, and techniques for presentation and interaction in these new computing environments. And we want to move away from a metaphor that has served us pretty damn well for well over two decades. We're still all collectively living off Doug and company's heritage, and it's time to get on to other things. Model interaction in the future, i.e. interaction through models and simulation, Doug's style of collaboration will be about team participant interaction, not user-computer interaction. Computers should go away. They should fade into the background. And we'll do that for exploring, problem-solving, social interaction, and various forms of creative expression. So, last slide. Your mission, certainly mine, but it could be yours should you choose to accept it, let's not talk about just raising the collective IQ of organizations. Let's raise the collective IQ of kids of all ages and do lifelong learning starting at a very young and tender age all the way to the end. Here's what I'd like to do in addition to everything else that's being done. I'd like to be some form of national effort to create clip models in all disciplines. A clip model, like clip art, contains everything you need for the task at hand. In this particular case, it needs behavior, it needs simulation capabilities. It's not a silver bullet, and lots of other ideas, toys that have computers built into them, are also terrific learning devices. But I think we should be able to get the classic interactive textbooks for chemistry, physics, mathematics, engineering, biology, social dynamics, archaeology, you name it, done if we have a national effort in which we all engage by submitting to repositories, not through some centrally controlled process. And I think I should stop because I'm about to be hooked out of there. Come join in that crusade. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>